Well, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for a lot of things in this life. Uh, one of the things that I'm most grateful for is that I have been brought up in the faith of Jesus Christ with a line of Christian formation on both sides of my family and my ancestry. But the one that I took to most or I resonated with, I, I, I integrated the most in my life was through my granny, my dad's mom. Uh, she was Trinidadian. She was highly principled. She was thoroughly biblical and charismatic, although she probably wouldn't have used that term or maybe didn't even know what that term was. So what does that mean? Well, I grew up with these stories of God showing up mysteriously and unmistakably, tangibly. Now, whether that was a, a time when she, as a young woman, was lost at night long before streetlights in rural Trinidad, uh, in an area known for its dangerous voodoo activity. And when she looked up to the sky after praying and saw a hand that was pointing, and she knew that that hand was pointing the way home for her, and of course she got home safely. I heard this story as a kid, and it riveted my imagination. Or that her prayers were more like conversations that could even get argumentative at times. Although she was having an argument with God, and that would scare the young kids that would be in the house listening to this conversation that was ongoing. But my personal favorite story is one that my dad would tell us as kids from time to time and and one that obviously entered into my heart and the story is this that one day that there was a, a beggar that came to the door a poor man and uh, this was the case back in those days in Trinidad where uh, a homeless person or somebody in need would go from door to door knock on the door and and ask for whatever the person of that house might be willing to give um, and again, I've shared this story in the past in other contexts because it's meant so much to me. And I've always trusted and prayed that it's been an encouragement to others. And I hope it is to you as well. But what was so special about this particular story was that there's a beggar that uh, knocked at the door. And my granny, who was very poor at that time and actually and quite struggling with uh, as a widow and having five kids to take care of, went back into her house to look for whatever she could give to this man who had knocked at the door. She finds a half penny, which was the lowest denomination at the time. And she puts it into the hand of this poor man. He puts out his hand and she sees a hole in his hand. And awe overcame her. She collapsed on the ground, overcome ecstatic by what had just happened, that Jesus had come to her. Now, the kind of comfort that that provided her was obviously astounding, as it was to me as a young child hearing this for the first time. And what was so special about this was that he came to her, especially in a time of deep need, in her distress, and just his presence consoled her. And he didn't do it with a profound display of power, uh, snapping his fingers and giving her a paycheck. Now, she was never well off before that or after that. Now, it is especially special because it displays the beautiful way that Jesus identified with her and rewarded her for her generosity and faithfulness in life. It's special to me because I am connected with a person who had a faith and a relationship with Jesus like that, and somehow I'm connected to this. But you know what? I'm not sure if I ever clearly and distinctly related that event to the passage for this Sunday where we commemorate the reign and the kingship of Jesus Christ. From Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 31, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people 
one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the one of the least of these, who are members of my family, you did it to me. Now, of course, hearing that story of my granny, there was somewhere a lesson about being generous to others, of course. But what took my attention was the fact that he was there. Strangely, I never made the connection that one of the most important ways to authenticate and ver or verify an appear appearance of Jesus in our time is to ask whether that event is consistent with scripture. In other words, did what happened today line up with the Jesus of the Bible? Now, once my youngest daughter, Alma, had a vision of Jesus where light was emanating from within Jesus, and that lines up with Jesus' transfiguration and, and also his claim to be the light of the world. In this particular, there's a direct, you welcomed me. But there's more. If we are to take this passage literally and seriously, what happened with my granny wasn't a one-time event that was reserved only for her or only for anyone else who is granted a special and rare opportunity to physically see Jesus Christ in this life. It's more than that. If we take Jesus at his word today, he is around us all the time. He's around us all the time. He said, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. What happened in this particular case with my granny was that the veil, that heavenly veil was removed for her to see Jesus in this man. It's an unmistakable directness to Jesus's language here. This isn't a parable that he had just finished teaching a whole lot of, where he speaks in metaphors about the reality, the powerful reality about the kingdom of God. In this particular teaching, he's dealing with a future real-time occurrence. This is what's going to happen. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he will sit on the throne of his glory. Now imagine that happening. Again, he's not speaking in, in hypotheticals here. There is symbolism, but it's tied to a future event. Coming facts. But today we are right on the edge of the season of Advent. For the weeks leading up to Christmas, we pay special attention to what Jesus said, that he is coming back in glory. And this teaching gives us what is, for many of us, a shocking witness into what that will look like. Words that come from Jesus himself. All the nations, all the nations of this world will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Sheep and goats. Well, in the ancient world, to the untrained eye, sheep and goats would look pretty much the same. But sheep had a lot more value because they had wool. And they'd get separated by the shepherd, one from the other. So the, the correlation for us is no matter who we are, it may be difficult for us to be able to tell from the outside, one from the other. We can't judge each other. We're in fact, we're called not to judge one another. 
but we do have a loving king, a loving and righteous judge who knows everything that there is to know about us. He knows what we have said. He knows what we have thought. And most importantly, he knows what we're not done. And one day he will call all the before him in truth and clarity to call things out for what they really are. Now, when I was in Israel in 2013, amazing, amazing experience. Our tour guide for most of that time was an Israeli Jew who was also an agnostic. That means she didn't really know what she believed spiritually. She wasn't sure, but she, we did talk about faith. And where we found we lined up about the nature of human life was this. She said to me, in this life, I have one shot. I have one shot in this life to make something of it. And I agreed with her. We do have one shot. Now we can take this one shot that we've been given and try to maximize the experience of this life for our own sake. We can gauge success or failure based on whether we've had the most positive experiences or the best relationships or have the most comforts or have the most choices in life. And most of us, because of the teaching of this world, we do default to that valuation of life in some way or another. But tragically, it's, it's off the mark. And it always leads to disappointment because one, the world cannot ever truly deliver what we most yearn for, the deepest satisfaction we long for. We can't do it. And two, the actions we have in this life have eternal consequences. If we look at life that we've been given through the teaching of Jesus, we are standing on very limited ground in this life. We are standing in a brief moment before eternity. And we know that to be true when we look at just our raw physicality. We know life is short. We have one shot before the limitless future beyond the grave. To be in the beauty of Jesus Christ forever, who died for the sins of this world, died for this, our sins in the fullness of his joy, that, that for which we were made for and Christ purchased for us by his death. When he says, come you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. What a statement of love and promise. But the other alternative, when we choose another path, is beyond tragic. It's an eternal separation from God in a place that God prepared for Satan and his evil spirits, a place where C.S. Lewis, the writer said, is locked from the inside by those who refuse to follow Christ's way. This will be a place for those who choose not to serve Jesus in the poor and the needy, those who choose a self-driven and unrepented life. It's tragic. It's beyond tragic. But the question for each and every one of us that should concern us is, which eternal future are we pointing towards? We are not on this earth for ourselves. Nature even attests to this. Flowers are not there for themselves, but to, but to provide beauty and to spread life. The life of Jesus Christ emulates, the, emulates that to the extreme. The one who gave up his life sacrificially for the world. And for those who follow him, our lives to be characterized by the same heart, if not usually the same outcome. According to God, according to God, the creator of all things, success in this life is not about how much we get, but except it's not about how much we get, but by how we give. That is success in life. How we give to the most vulnerable of people. And this is how we can tangibly show our love for God by following the second great commandment, to love thy neighbor as thyself. 
Now, Jesus had a younger brother named James who wrote a letter that is part of the New Testament correspondence in the Bible. And he said these words, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Now, part of the sad pattern of our spiritual foundations in this world that as we judge them is that we tend to separate faith from action like some people have somehow the believing gene they're the ones that have the conviction and feel it in their hearts and then there are others that have the serving gene and they're the ones that feel more alive when they actually do things for others but the bible makes no distinction between Conviction in the heart of Jesus Christ and serving, they both go together. To love God with all of our heart, soul, and understanding, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, these are the two great commandments upon which all other laws are based. By grace, through faith, Christians believe that Jesus Christ died upon the cross for our selfishness and pride, for our sin, and justified us before God through his sacrifice, and rose again to a new imperishable resurrected life, the firstborn from the dead and the forerunner of our eternal inheritance. This is the keystone of our faith. And that faith worked into our hearts by the Holy Spirit does not lie dormant as a dry doctrinal, doctrinal formula. It does not stay there. But that faith gets to work. And we are motivated to serve through this faith in this world that is so hurting, as we well know. We seek to serve Christ in those who are suffering in the church and in the world because Christ did that and because everything is done for us. As Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, if our hearts are not drawn towards serving others, if we don't make efforts to support those who are suffering or, and are in need, if we're not growing in generosity, then we have to question. We have to question by looking at the teaching of Jesus, looking at the Bible, we have to question whether the faith we have is really in Christ or is it in somewhere else or someone else. We have to question where we are pointed at this one shot that we have in life. In the early church, there was a bishop in either Spain or Italy, we're not too sure where, named Epiphanius, the Latin. And he described the ways in which Jesus is served when we serve the least in this world. He said this, The Lord hungers not in his own nature, but in the saints. The Lord thirsts not in his own nature, but in his poor. The Lord who clothes everyone is not naked in his own nature, but in his servants. The Lord who is able to heal all sickness and has already destroyed death itself is not diseased in his own nature, but in his servants. Our Lord, the one who can liberate every person, is not in prison in his own nature, but in his saints. Therefore, you see, my most beloved, that the saints are not alone. They suffer all these things because of the Lord. In the same way, because of the saints, the Lord suffers all these things with them. Now, my friends, this Sunday, the reign of Christ, we behold his glory and his greatness, and we look for his coming again in all of his majesty, as we are right on the edge of Advent. But what does it look like to serve a king like this, that is Lord over all things, that is triumphed over the grave? Well, he lays it out for us. He says, turn to the people in your lives. Turn to the people that are beyond your circle of friends and acquaintances. 
Look for the ones that are suffering and serve them, help them. Then you will be loving the Lord of glory in a way that he calls us to. Well, there's a number of ways in which we can give, my friends, that today is also a Sunday where we support the work of Faith Works in the Diocese of Toronto, where that faith turns into works. And there's many lives that are touched and blessed by that. Our church here at St. Mary and St. Martha has been very involved in this for some time. And so we want to encourage you to give to this great ministry. You can do that online. Um, when we do our welcome for the offertory, Father Murray will give us a bit of an intro to that. There's also a couple of other ministries I want to draw our attention to. One is our food drive for the three food banks that we are partnering with in the neighborhood, as we notice that food banks are taking up now twice the number of requests for food because of this pandemic that we're all struggling through. There's also a ministry in our area, which is one that is incredibly important that serves indigenous people, especially indigenous women who have been abused. And we as a church have given to this ministry and we're gonna to continue to do that. There are many, many ways where Jesus is alive and, and walking amongst us as he approached my granny all those years ago. And he looks at us, inviting us to serve him through the least of these. My friends on this Reign of Christ Sunday, let's pray to this great King and seek to serve him. Father, we confess that in a world of struggle and the concerns we feel in our lives, we can circle the wagons around our own individual lives or our own families and forget about the needs of others. But you say, Lord, that you exist in the hearts and in the lives of those that are suffering, that when we serve others, we are serving you. Help us, God, to be unlocked in our beings. Help us to be made truly generous so that lives are touched and that we bring glory to you as we head towards our eternal future with you. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of hearing your teaching and pray that it bears much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen.